Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> We're here to talk about our robot overlords to come. Um, so I'll just start out with let, asking our guests to introduce themselves a little bit. Uh, Polkit, I'll start with you. So I, I looked at your website. It, it looks horrifying. You've got, you're going to program the drones to think for themselves and come after us. Is that a, a fair summary? <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your company doing? Uh, so just to answer that, we're, we're literally at the tip of the cusp of artificial general intelligence. We're really far away from achieving human-like intelligence. So. But uh, anyway, I'm the founder and CEO of SwarmX. Uh, our mission is to automate the robotic workforce. We're starting out with drones primarily because that's where, uh, you know, there's clearly a low lowest hanging fruit when it comes to, you know, using robots for different kinds of applications like oil and gas mining. And what we're doing is we're getting rid of the human element. Right now, if you're operating drones for various purposes, you would need to, you know, hire people to fly the drone, maintain the drone look at the data, make sense of it, and provide the actionable insight. So we kind of get rid of the, the, the middleware and give you what you're looking for, which is the actual data. So it involves a whole bunch of hardware that is enabling this automation to take place. And then we have uh, several layers of AI that's built in that allows the data to be processed and uh, you know, the final insight to be made available. So in short, that's what we do. And who are your customers? Can you? Talk a little bit about <laughs> what, what these guys are working on. We've we have had some public uh, disclosures when it comes to where we have done our deployments. We have uh, major uh, customers in the oil and gas um, mining as well as renewable energy sector, uh, specifically in renewable energy, solar farm and wind farm management. So that's kind of uh, what we're focusing on right now. We also work with uh, several government agencies to you know help uh, uh, secure critical uh, government infrastructure as well. So that's uh, where our key focus is right now. <laughs> okay. Yi Wang, uh, sorry, Wang Yi. Um, Either way. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I can't do it the wrong way. Um, so you're, you're in the education space. So yep. You've gotten some coverage on this. You're working with AI that's teaching people English. Can you talk a little bit about how you got into that line of work? And sure. Uh, Yi, I'm the founder and CEO of Liu Li Shuo, which literally means speak friendly in Chinese. We are probably one of the largest language learning app in China with 45 million registered users. Uh, this is our fifth year uh, doing the startup. Um, we didn't start out as an AI company. Back then, there wasn't even the notion of internet plus education, let alone AI plus education. Okay, at that point, we were just trying to uh, create a use uh, mobile solution for learning a Okay, let's maybe let them fix your mic, and we'll <laughs> we'll come back to you in a second. Um, so uh, we've got the theme of the the question of this little panel is what Hello. why every um, startup needs to know about AI. I mean, my my first answer to the question was because venture capital. Um, <laughs> apart from that, you know, what what are what are the compelling reasons for a startup um, to to be interested in this space and following it closely? Well. Let me get to the first point first, which is uh, you talked about venture capital. Well, it's only going to be valid for at most another two years. Because mm. what we're seeing right now is AI whitewashing. Like everybody wants to claim that they're an AI startup just to get funding. Uh, that's not going to be the case in two years' time because investors will take it for granted that you have AI built into your company. The other obvious uh, reasons why everybody should get into AI, otherwise you're going to be signing your own debt certificate, is because you want to start looking at things that can be fully automated in your uh, workflow. This includes you know, finding repetitive tasks that you are currently doing in order to make your customers' lives better. Can you make your employees focus on something better than doing those repetitive tasks? That's where AI comes really handy. And aside from that, uh, it's basically just looking and finding the right efficiencies, uh, again, within your existing workflow. So that's kind of uh, where we are, uh, you know, when we, when we think of applying AI in our company, that's what we, what we think of. Okay, let me have a second try, okay? <laughs> uh, well, um, I think, you know, coming back to your, um, to Pete's uh, earlier question and to the theme of the session, really, I think a lot of people, I guess a lot of uh, entrepreneurs right here, um, I think it's a mistake to, you know, really build the hammer first before you know what problem or what nail you want to nail it on. Okay, um, you know, I've, 
I had techo, techno background. I had a PhD in computer science. All three co-founders of the company had technical background. I worked at um, Silicon Valley startups or uh, high-tech uh, companies. But we didn't you know, come up with a technical solution first. Back in 2012, we thought, okay, language learning is a very big problem, big market. People are paying so much, but they are getting so little in return. So we identified the problem first. We thought, okay, maybe the first thing we, w we should do is to digitize uh, the process. So here's keyword number one, digitization. I think whatever industry you are in, if you're thinking of, you know, maybe I would want leverage AI in some way or form or fashion, you may want to th start thinking about how to digitize it first. Be otherwise, it's really hard to, to make it work. But then, you know, we, we build a clever speech uh, assessment engine where, you know, people can practice um, speaking right on their phones and with real-time feedback, you know, a lot of Chinese users, they are really shy. You know, they don't want, you know, you know, you know practice speaking in front of the, uh, the others. So we give them the opportunity to try it right in their home. And then over time, you, we start to realize, okay, we've co collected you know, enough data to number one, make our uh, speech assessment engine the, the best in class in the world. And then it's the right time when we get more and more user feedback asking, hey, you know, your, your tool is kind of nice, but you know, we, I just paid you know, $5,000 to the other offline trainer. I'm like, okay, yes, maybe we should start building a more systematic solution so people can really get from here to there, you know, right in, 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 in the convenience of, uh, of their palms. So that's when we start saying, okay, so what's really the nice properties of a really good top-notch human English teacher that you want to hire? No, he or she can teach you well in a very personalized way. And he or she can assign really personalized exercise to you, give you assessment and feedback. So we sort of extract these models out of a human teacher and we start to ask ourselves questions like, you know, can AI do that? Can we have the level of personalization but without the cost and the problem in scalability? So that's when we start to realize, okay, now actually we can build something, you know, with the user base and the weight of the data. Then, you know, two years later we launched the, you know, that was the conversation we had back in 2014, and two years later, we launched our first, which we believe the first AI teacher in the world, uh, almost exactly one year ago. And uh, since then, you know, we've shown our data has shown that our AI teacher can actually triple the learning efficiency comparing to the conventional method. Basically, with the okay, same. Okay, but hold on, hold on, hold <laughs> on. It sounds like a great product. Let me ask you though. I mean, in terms of going after the funding after the money you need to like build this stuff out. I mean, when you guys started, presumably it was a lot quieter market about AI than it is now. Now everybody, you know, has an AI startup, it seems like, and it's a very, very hot topic. Like, how do you distinguish yourselves, you know, if you're going to advise a startup here, you know, that is considering going into this line of AI being a vastly wide thing? Like, what are, what are the lessons you know, that you would tell them now in terms of establishing the scope, you know, what kind of scale they need to establish, what do they need to think about, assuming they're going to they're gonna have a startup? We didn't raise any round telling the investor we are an AI company, actually. Mm. We told them this is a big market, you know, and the, 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 the previous generation, they focus on teacher-centric learning. We told them we're going to build a product. We didn't tell them we are an AI company. We tell them, okay, they are solving the learning problem by, you know, offering an army of teachers. Now we are going to offer uh, a different solution centered around mobile product. That's what we told them. The, Paul Kitt, what do you tell? What do you tell your people? Well, um, the, uh, the AI was never a part of our story. The story was always the mission. And right. the mission was to automate every kind of robot out there. And that's the story that we stuck with throughout all our funding rounds. Um, in fact, uh, the, well, fortunately for us, the investors that we were working with they knew about you know, a lot of other companies in the space. So they're very, very well versed with this whole AI field. So they took AI for granted. I mean, we are building the product. It's obviously going to be using certain algorithms to let the drones fly in the air, autonomously collect data, send it back to the customers. So AI was kind of taken for granted. Now, I mean, you guys are kind of in different 
or maybe it's the same space, but my understanding is AI is a, you know, an artificial intelligence, something that learns, and that's where you get like the big data, you know, or like they've got AI that listens to music now and then compo composes it. But I mean, it seems like the term is getting abused. I mean, are your drones learning from, is there a big data aspect of it? Or are so, these so just AI automated? is a very broad term, right? So tr in traditional programming, you define a bunch of use cases. Like if something happens, I want X action to be uh, taking place. Mm. That's the conventional way AI used to work. And now with the, uh, you know, the uh, advancements in deep learning, you're basically training the AI. You're telling the AI, OK, here are some use cases. Uh, this is the outcome. You learn from those outcomes. And then the next time, if I show you something similar, this is the outcome you're going to take. So it's no longer about you know, defining these predefined um, uh, you know, actions. You're actually collecting a lot of label data yep. and, and training with it. And that's kind of what we're doing. We have access to you know, terabytes of drones flying over different kinds of faults. So we're training this visual intelligence to uh, be able to like, recognize whatever the customer is looking for. E, I mean, you're in a really crowded space, too. I mean, English language education in China is just, there's tons of startups there. I mean, how worried are you about people just like listening to this and starting up a company just like yours and catching up? Like, how hard is it to do what you do? I got this question five years ago. Mm. And I kept getting this question uh, every so often. But I'm, uh, this is the answer I've been telling people. You know, if you look, you know, something really far away, everything looks the same. So people say, hey, why are you building yet another mobile app for language learning? I'm like, yes, this is an app, but it's not only an app. So, uh, so far, I think the barrier, you know, I always view uh, the, the, the growth of a startup like launching a rocket, okay? You have the first stage, you know, you know, then you, you, you sort of, that serves its purpose and it drops off and you, you ignite, you start the second stage, you know, propeller and you, you go oh, so on and so forth. So th really the first stage for us is leverage. We didn't have anything. We only had a team. So that stage, our only competitive advantage was, you know, a team that can build, you know, nice user experience and we have, uh, can build proprietary speech recognition algorithms. And the second stage was where we got like close to maybe 10 million users when we get a little bit of a data and we built you know, around the data a nicer algorithm engine and also we built a community. That increased the stickiness of the product. And then the third stage is where we built the structured uh, curriculum, the total solution with the uh, adaptive learning engine that itself got us even more data. Remember, you know, when you are talking about learning data, it's not like taking snapshots. This is where a lot of the education companies do today. You know, they are taking exam snapshots. We're taking movies. From the point a user started learning our app, it's like a whole movie trace of like months, even years. Then this kind of data, with every single move, you inter you're inter interacting with any, every exercise that challenges. That's the kind of data that gives us a huge advantage. Do you guys think the, uh, the, I'll call it hype about AI, you know, I mean, it's, it's just super hot, is attracting too much market entry? Is there, I mean, there's obviously been a lot of money sloshing around in the market, feeding a bunch of startups. I mean, has that been a problem? I mean, how, do you, how do you see things going forward in terms of competition in, the, in this space? In, in terms of the customer base, yes, definitely it has affected us because there are a lot of companies out there now going up to big oil and gas companies and you know solar farm companies telling them, hey, we'll use AI to like fix a lot of your issues. So for them as well, uh, since it's a very crowded space, they've been holding off on, you know, making use of use of a lot of these technologies. So it's definitely affected us. But uh, again, um, the the differentiating factor is the end goal that you have, which is pretty much to you know increase their efficiencies. That's pretty much the 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 story that we've told them. And but how do you uh, tell them our AI is better than that guy's AI? I mean, how do you, how do we you don't. illustrate it? No? <laughs> we don't. We don't tell them any of that. We just tell them, okay, I'll take an oil and gas company, for example, right? Mm. They have a very remote offshore oil rig that has uh, potential to blow up. So they have somebody climb up the oil rig. The next option for them is to have somebody fly the drone. The next level of that is to fully automate that process and have uh, you know, a drone take off from a pod autonomously look at the thing five times a day, send back the data, and not only just send back the data, but also tell them that your offshore oil rig is safe. Right. That confirmation is very important. That's what we tell them. Like, we're going to fully automate it end-to-end. -end. And 
it works. Sounds terrifying. Well, All right, we're are, almost out of time, but so I'll give you the last, case, the last uh, comment. You know, we don't, we don't, <laughs> we think um, we don't feel much of a competition. Hmm. The reason being, um, you know, uh, we didn't start as an AI company. So, uh, you know, and right around, you know, 2015, maybe early 2016, the AI buzz would start to you know heat up and uh, you see a lot of companies going to the VCs and saying okay we have a great team you know give us money we're gonna be in the AI for that sector so but uh, you know recently I've been having having some conversation with investors they say okay we see three types three categories of AI companies one category is with a team they have a good resume but like no technology mm -hmm. okay and we have some a category of companies that has some kind of technology but it hasn't built any you know, usable product yet. And then the third categories are, are the companies who have built something, like a robot or anything, but it doesn't sell well. It generates no profits. Mm. Okay, these three categories, companies together, they are accounting for like 90, maybe 95% of the companies with AI in their description. So, you know, in our case, we have already gone through the three phases and we, we, we close the loop. And so we think we are, you know, we're, 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 you know, we are just concentrated on you know, really doing what uh, we are good at really well. And by the way, I, I just want to add one more thing. Uh, maybe there are some entrepreneurs right here. You, know, you, can, you can think out of the box. So far, 95% of the AI-themed companies, they focus on B2B business, right? They sell solutions. They sell a component to an upstream you know, uh, customer or downstream provider or whatever, or vice versa. But you know, if you can find a niche where you can go direct to consumers, and if you can find a way to very efficiently close the loop and get the money from the consumers directly, congratulations, you found something. And uh, there, you, you may be able to get a self-sustainable business pretty, pretty, uh, you know, pretty quickly. And you will have, uh, you know, if you are ahead, you can, if you can get ahead in the game of collecting data, and that there might be some relatively sustainable competitive advantage you can hold on to. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.